The year was 1910. Most of the forces of the atom were yet to be understood. But in a small physics lab at the University of Chicago, a young graduate student named Harvey Fletcher was on the verge of a major discovery. Seeking to demonstrate properties of atomic particles, he shot oil droplets into an electric field through a beam of brilliant light. When he viewed the result through a microscope, the effect was magical. The field was full of little starlets having all the colors of the rainbow. They executed the most fascinating dance. By switching the field off and on with the right timing, one could keep a selected droplet in the field of view for a long time. Researchers had already measured the mass of an electron. Now, for the first time in history, they would be able to measure the electric charge. The technological fallout was huge. First vacuum tubes, then radio and television. Eventually, Harvey Fletcher would pioneer advances in everything from hearing aids to stereophonic sound. In the process, he would become one of the country's most distinguished physicists, one of BYU's most celebrated educators, and a leader of national influence in the church. When Harvey was born of pioneer parents in 1884, there were no automobiles in Provo and scant electricity. But these rural surroundings didn't curb the Fletcher boy's interest in science, which was first sparked by climbing the surrounding hills to watch the trains in the valley below. I measured the time it took for the sound to travel from the train to where we were sitting on the mountain. We could see the white steam from the whistle, then look at our watches to see how many seconds passed before we could hear it. But when it came time for formal education, Harvey's attitude about school was fairly relaxed. Though he breezed through math at the Y, neglecting his homework earned him an F in physics. His pride suitably bruised, he repented. The following year, he not only got an A-plus in the course, but his first paid job as an instructor in the physics lab. Harvey also worked part-time as a surveyor. So during his second year of college, he volunteered to help lay out the first school letters on Y Mountain. Student body officers were to paint in the letters afterward, beginning with the Y. But when they arrived on the site, they were appalled. The letter was clearly laid out wrong and badly distorted. Harvey finally convinced them that his team had calculated the angle of inclination so the letters would look right from the valley. He was correct. The design was perfect. But spreading the stones in lime was another story. It was so much work that the B and the U were never finished. By 1906, Harvey had graduated. Almost immediately, he began teaching full-time at the Y for $750 a year. But he soon felt the need to further his education in physics, so he and his wife Lorena traveled to the University of Chicago. Harvey worked his way through graduate school there, teaching high school science and running lantern projectors for the faculty. When it came time to begin his master's thesis, Dr. Robert Milliken, Harvey's advisor, suggested he expand on a study done at Cambridge, seeking to measure the charge of electrons. Experiments there had faltered because researchers were working with water vapor, which evaporated too quickly. Harvey decided to try oil, and he set up a makeshift apparatus with one of his lantern projectors while Milliken was out of town. The result was the now famous oil drop experiment. The ensuing research helped earn Harvey the very first summa cum laude honors ever given a Chicago physics graduate. The same research earned Robert Milliken a Nobel Prize. In spite of job offers from across the country, Harvey returned to BYU in 1911, where he continued his oil drop research. But even while he taught at BYU, other job offers continued. One was from Western Electric, which would soon become Bell Telephone. The offer was so rich with scientific opportunity, Harvey finally gave in. President Brimhall was incensed and accused him of being disloyal to the church. In turmoil, Harvey decided to visit with President Joseph F. Smith about the decision. After listening to my story, he sat pondering for a few minutes and then said, Yes, I want you to go and take this position, but promise this, that you will keep your testimony strong and keep up your church activities. If you do so, you can do more good for the church in New York City than you could here at BYU, and you will be successful in your work. The statement would prove prophetic, though it wouldn't seem so initially. During his first year at Bell, Harvey never set foot in a lab. 
Insisting he first become familiar with a the telephone, they assigned him equipment installation, long distance routing, and repair. Harvey even spent time as a hello girl or telephone operator. What he gained from these experiences, he reported later, was mostly a sore ear. But when he finally got into the laboratory, success came quickly. Harvey's longtime interest in sound led to the manufacture of a user-friendly device to measure human hearing. Today, the audiometer facilitates nationwide hearing testing for school children. Next came prototypes for various hearing aids. The first was so large the electronics were housed in a cabinet. As technology improved, Harvey was asked to create a group hearing aid for attendees of the National Heart of Hearing Conference at the Hotel Astor in New York City. He opened the meeting by giving instructions on the new device. Then, an intermission had to be called. Harvey stood and watched quietly as tears ran down the participants' cheeks. Many were crying, I can hear, I can hear. It was the first time most of them had ever heard a public speech. After this emotional experience, I felt that I should help these people more, if possible. They urged me to be a candidate to lead the national organization. So in 1929, I was elected president. In this capacity, Harvey was able to help aid the hearing of a host of American industry leaders. One was Thomas Edison, who Harvey met later at a national convention and asked how his device was working. When I used to attend these dinners, I sat in silence wondering what the after-dinner speaker was saying. Now with the hearing aid, I usually find it so dull, I turn it off and turn my thoughts to my inventions. By this time, Bell Labs had become a leader in the field of acoustics, and Harvey was director of all physical research. Meanwhile, he had also followed President Smith's injunction to help build the kingdom in New York. In 1936, after serving 10 years as president of the New York branch of the church, Harvey became the second president of the New York stake. Today, he is recognized as one of the church's most influential figures in the eastern United States. Before Harvey left Bell Labs, his research would also impact the entertainment industry. During the 1930s, he worked with famed conductor Leopold Stokowski to develop stereophonic sound. Their demonstrations culminated in a stereo broadcast of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir to Carnegie Hall. Harvey followed with several advances in sound recording, including a gold medal award from the Motion Picture Academy for the invention of optical sound for the movies. Finally, after 33 years at Bell Laboratories and a citation by President Harry Truman for acoustics work during World War II, Harvey retired. In 1952, he returned to BYU, working with President Ernest Wilkinson to form the College of Physical and Engineering Sciences. Along with his enduring contributions to the Y, Harvey's career had yielded 19 patents and honorary degrees from six institutions. He had served at the head of four national societies and had become the first Latter-day Saint to be elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Harvey Fletcher was a man who dared to discover, but his life was marked by more than advances in science and technology. His hard work, compassion, and faithful service left a lasting influence on his university, his church, and his fellow man.